Mm. All right, good morning. Let me just put this. I'm going to upload this to the other class and then we can get started. Okay, let's go for it. So, last time, let's see, what did we do last time? Uh, okay, we were talking about stereoisomers. We did RNS configurations. Where did we leave off here? So we were looking at kind of drawing molecules given their names or assigning their names, or assigning a molecule coming up with a name. That's right, that's right, that's right. Okay, um, so we kind of left off there, so that'll be stuff for homework to continue on practicing. We're going to see um, that there are properties of these chiral compounds, and we're going to then talk about chiral compounds some more. So good morning, good morning. So uh, it's interesting to note that chiral compounds... are called optically active. Um, because uh, they will rotate polarized light. So light normally is kind of goes in, in all directions, right? Uh, if you have a light ray going like this, you'll have one that's like this and one that's slightly off to the side. Okay, I'm, I'm terrible at drawing this. Let me, let me find a picture on Google because polarized light is so hard to draw. Okay. So um, here we go. Switching over to Google real quick. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. New window. So polarized light is going in all different directions. So we've got all, or sorry, regular light, yeah, is in all directions, going crazy, zipping around every kind of angle you can see. Here we go. Oh, look, we even have a, uh, a moving one. So unpolarized light has uh, light waves angled in every direction. So you have the entire 360 degree. Uh, everything's covered by light. If you pass light through a polarizer, though, it will block off all light orientations that are not the exact same as your polarizer. So uh, example here, you've got a vertical polarizer, which is going to make every the only light it's going to let through is in that plane that's going straight up and straight down. And here we have a horizontal one. This is how like sunglasses work, by the way, is they will block certain uh, planes of light. So um what's interesting to note though is now once we have polarized light it's all in one plane and it turns out that if you pass that polarized light we'll switch over here so polarized light is all in one plane so it's just going straight up and straight down or whatever angle it happens to be going at, but it's only one angle. When you pass that light through, goes through a solution containing a chiral compound the light gets rotated. And uh, I actually will find an image on Google for that. For that. So we're going to see how this is going to work in just a second. So, uh, but I'll let you copy this down. So chiral molecules will rotate light, polarized light. And we're going to see that we're going to be able to calculate this fun stuff. 
The only calculation we're going to be doing in OCHEM is this. So this is the only math we're going to have, and it's not very difficult. So here we go. Here's an image of this. So we have light, all directions, going through a polarizer. Now all that light is vertically stuck. We pass it through a tube containing our chiral compound. And we end up rotating it. And then we can go ahead and detect it later. Um, and so we're going to see here that we can calculate um, this sort of thing. We are going to be able to calculate how much of one enantiomer we have, as well as kind of the direction that things are rotating light uh, using some, some math. So our first kind of thing to talk about is what's called specific rotation. And the specific rotation of, of a molecule kind of tells us uh, like to what degree it will rotate light. And uh, so we typically will represent this as alpha in brackets, which is going to be equal to, if you remember your spectrophotometry thing from last time, if we did a simulation on that, that's going to be your kind of observed rotation. This is going to be the concentration of your sample. And this is the path length that the light is going through. Typically, uh, this is standardized uh, as 10 centimeters or one decimeter. Uh, for this sort of exercise, it, it's usually uh, limited to about 10 centimeters. And uh, so typically, though, we, we report this number in decimeters for some reason. So that's one decimeter if it's got two sig figs. And so uh, we can go ahead and calculate something. So if we have, say, what's one? Let's do one from our book here. Let me find where this section is. All right, here we go. We're going to talk about MSG. So let's do it. In goes our MSG. By the way, MSG not harmful, just an amino acid. Uh, where did this one go? Okay, so we've got 0 0.575 grams of this MSG dissolved in 10 mils of water. Uh, sample is put in a cell of 10 centimeter length and the observed rotation is 1.47 degrees. One point four seven degrees. Positive. We'll talk about what positive and negative means in this context in a little bit. So here we go. Uh, note the, the units for our concentration. We typically will use grams per mil for concentration. Uh, usually make things a little bit easier. Um, and we're going to use the decimeter thing so it, uh, it kind of works out with, with this calculation. So um, we can go ahead and do it. So the specific rotation at whatever light source we happen to be using and whatever temperature we happen to be using would be equal to our observed angle of rotation. Over our concentration times the path length. Calculation does not seem to be very difficult, so it would be 1.47 over I can do this. 0 0.0575, which equals to, I don't have a calculator, let's use Google, 1.47 divided by 0 0.0575. OK, 
Okay. Oh, I'm looking at images. That's fine. Okay. Uh, we get 25.56. It looks like for this one, we're going to have three sig figs, so 25.6 degrees. And we, it's in, important that we indicate that that's positive. So um, the specific rotation, again, just kind of tells us like um, some information about it. So kind of our standard rotation of a molecule. We're going to see that plus things are dextro rotatory. They move they rotate things clockwise. Or just like with our RNS that's to the right. If we're driving a car, if we want to go clockwise, we are turning right in our car. Um, and so those are indicated with a positive sign. Negative rota rotation angles are called levorotatory. And those would be counterclockwise rotation. And so for any given molecule, I think we've got some in the book here. Any given molecule, uh, the alpha here is uh, negative 23.1. The enantiomers alpha is the opposite of it. So uh, we see here that one of them will rotate like clockwise, one will rotate it counterclockwise. It so happens that this is the R enantiomer and this is the S enantiomer, but R and S, they have nothing to do, they have nothing to do with alpha. So there's no correlation that R is always negative or lever rot lebo rotatory, and S is not always dextro rotatory. It just happens to be for this case. They have nothing to do with each other. So one is a physical way of how the light is interacting with it. So this is experimentally derived. Um, the R and S we do theoretically. Those are something we look at a molecule and we are assigning priorities and choosing things this way. So they don't have anything to do with each other. So there's no correlation between dextrorotatory and R and S or lever rotatory. So although they, they, they work with enantiomers and enantiomers typically will have, I'm sorry, chiral molecules will have R and S configurations. Um, they will also have a lever rotatory one and a dextrorotatory one. And so, um, we can work with that. All right, so what's important though is that we can determine kind of once we know alpha, we can determine kind of what sort of mixture we have. If we have the same compound but different stereoisomers we can determine uh, some things about stereoisomers. So once we have this specific rotation of a molecule, we can use it to determine the purity of a sample. If the observed is equal to your alpha, either positive or negative, you have an enantio, an enantio pure mixture, or rather an enantio, enantio pure sample. So you have only one enantiomer. If what you're looking at is, uh, if your observed angle is equal to your, um, specific rotation, 
under the normal conditions, you have an enantio pure sample. So uh, it's optically pure. It's just got one enantiomer. You have it by itself. If you have no rotation, that means you have what's called a racemic mixture. And that is a 50-50 of each enantiomer. So you have equal of the R and S enantiomers. And so as a result, they, their rotation will cancel each other out. So half the molecules will rotate the light counterclockwise. The other half will rotate it clockwise. As a result, you'll have no change at the end. So um, you'll see there that uh, a racemic mixture, which is a 50-50 mixture, will um, be the other case. So either you have a pure enantiomer or a 50-50 mixture. Those are the easy cases. And so if, if, it's gonna, if your thing is greater than zero but less than your specific rotation, you have something, you have one enantiomer in excess than the other one. So if it's zero, you have a 50-50 mixture, so you have the equal. If you have it equal to the rotation, then you have a pure sample. But if you have it somewhere in between, then one of those enantiomers is excess. And we, pref we typically will call this one enantiomeric excess. And that is just your observed value and your uh, your, or your specific rotation times 100%. <clears throat> so it's a way of calculating how much excess you have of one enantiomer. And let's, let's do an example. So, um, bah, 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 bah. so <clears throat> specific rotation of pure adrenaline, so epinephrine, is negative 53 degrees, pure. If we take a mixture and we have observed it to have negative 45, we can calculate the enantiomeric excess of this. We can see <clears throat> percent EE we 45, we can just use the absolute value here, over 53 times 100%, which is 85%. And this tells us <clears throat> that 85% of the mixture is one isomer. And it's the same one that since uh, our, our observed angle and our um, specific rotation were both negative, that tells us the negative one is the predominant one. If um, no, we're good there. So your predominant one will have the same sign. So whatever the, the negative one is, that's the, uh, the predominant one. So that 85% leaves us with 15%. The other 15% is racemic. Because this is the amount that's in excess. 85% is the excess. Yes, right. The other 50% is racemic. So the excess of it is the amount you have more than that you have of the racemic mixture. And so if you were to actually look at this mixture, you'd say you'd have 80, or 
I can do this. 92.5% the negative one. And the other 7.5% is your positive in antimer. And that 7.5% is half of 15, right? So this is 15 over 2 plus 85, and that's just 15 over 2, right? Because the 15% is racemic, so that part, half of it is plus, half of it is minus. So our mixture, therefore, once we've seen the enantiomeric excess, our mixture is this. We have 92% adre negative adre levorotatory adrenaline, and we have 7.5% dextrorotatory adrenaline. So what the enantiomer of this. All right, so it's um, simply a way of kind of analyzing a mixture potentially of enantiomers and seeing what that mixture is. So this sample is 92.5% levorotatory and then the other 7.5% uh, is dextrorotatory. So this is an analytical technique for you to determine how good your enantioselective process was. If you are making adrenaline, we're gonna see that oftentimes we're gonna have competing reactions. Some of them will give us the wrong enantiomer. Have we talked about the purpose of this stuff, by the way? I don't think we have. Um, super important <coughs> to have these things because <coughs> enantiomers or rather chiral compounds they react biologically in potentially different ways so even though they're the same molecules, just having them rotated in 3D, <clears throat> I'm going to, uh, let, me, let me give you an example here. What is the structure? Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. Let me go to Wikipedia. Okay, here we go. So, here's one. Sorry, I have to get this molecule going. There we go. And I'm gonna copy it for it's an enantiomer. The enantiomer, remember we just switched the wedge and the dash. These two are enantiomers. <coughs> and I forget which one is the good one and the bad one. But, uh, let me just see here. Which one is it? Uh, da, 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 da. One of these, okay, there we go. All right, I can't remember which one's the, the good one and the bad one. <clears throat> Suffice it to say, I might be totes wrong about this, but <clears throat> this was used to treat morning sickness. And so it was a nice, happy drug, esthalidomide. Again, I might be wrong about which the R or the S, which one is the like good one. The other one, unfortunately, caused Terrible birth defects. And so it's super important that the correct enantiomer is used. Unfortunately, with this one, there is a reaction we'll talk about where they will actual, actually racemize within the body, which is even worse. So unfortunately, biologically, 
different enantiomers can have the opposite effect. They could have no effect um, or just something completely terrible on the other side, a side effect. Many drugs that we, we take are chiral compounds. Some of them have one enantiomer that works. Some have both enantiomers that work. Some have one enantiomer that works for the targeted condition, and the other one causes side effects that are undesirable, headaches, whatever. Biologically speaking, the idea of stereoisomers is super important. And so um, this is an example in, in, I think, the 60s or something. It, uh, it was a wonderful drug to treat morning sickness in pregnant women. But the other enantiomer caused the children, the babies, to have terrible birth defects. And so, you know, unfortunately, this wasn't something that was picked up in, in the trials at the time because they weren't as developed as they are now. But, you know, they saw, oh, well, it treated the morning sickness. No observable side effects were good to go. But when all those babies started being born, some really bad things started to happen. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's other things that it does too. It causes blood clots, but it also treats cancers. Like, it's, um, it's a tough thing. So, um, oh, it's not working, but um, anyways, so, okay, then, then there we go. I've, uh, I lied to us. So I just had to Google that. Okay, we'll switch those two. So it, it's the uh, the S one that was bad. Oh, undo that. There we go. Ta-da, I fixed it. Thank you, Kevin. So there are certainly biological ramifications to these. Um, and in some cases, it's not severe. Like if we take L-glucose, which is the enantiomer of D-glucose. D-glucose is the normal glucose that we need to react. I'm sorry, that was Lovepreet, um, not Kevin who looked that up, sorry. I'm just so used to Kevin being our source of information, so sorry. Um, uh, where was I going with this? Yeah, so sometimes big, big problems here happen with the wrong enantiomer. Sometimes nothing happens. Like L-glucose, you might just get diarrhea, but you won't absorb it, so it's calorie-free, I suppose. Uh, tastes like sugar, so your taste receptors still take it, but uh, since it doesn't get absorbed by our body, since those receptors don't uh, recognize L-glucose, uh, it ends up keeping a lot of water in your digestive tract, which leads to diarrhea. So um, sometimes things like this work, sometimes they don't. Sometimes there's no effect, sometimes there's minor side effects. The point is the body recognizes these differently, because all of our proteins come up with you know everything that happens in the body all the enzymes all the receptors all the channels all the structural elements are all proteins and all proteins are chiral so they react with different things different uh, way yeah so there we go so yeah and sometimes yeah bacteria can recognize things that we can't and apparently you can get gas too with uh, l glucose so there we go so the point is it is very important that we understand how much of an enantiomeric excess we have because things like this could happen. If we don't give the like 100% of the enantiomer we want, bad things can happen. So this is a way for us to check very easily if uh, we have an enantiopure mixture or a racemic mixture or some excess of one enantiomer. So... Uh, there are reasons for doing all this stuff. Okay. Let's see, where did I want to go next? All right, let's talk about symmetry. Yeah. All right. So that's the importance of this. So there is absolute relevance. Pharmacology and more kind of advanced organic chemistry is all about enantioselective chemical synthesis. In this course, we're, we're going to talk about stereochemistry, but 
Uh, oftentimes, like we can't install a particular uh, wedge or dash. Oftentimes, we're just going to be given one, and then we can keep the stereochemistry or change it. But it's very hard to specifically choose to put something as a wedge if you don't have anything there to begin with. So we'll see uh, that. It, for us right now, we're we're not going to be able to kind of focus on making enantiopure mixtures, uh, but we will we'll do what we can. All right, let's talk about symmetry. And so we've discussed this yesterday, not yesterday, but uh, the other day. We had our trans. Die sub and our cis one. We saw the enantiomers. We saw these last time, right? If we consider the right two, the pair of enantiomers, they're the cis ones. It turns out that if we stick a axis of rotation through this molecule and rotate it along that axis, so if we rotate the molecule like this, we see that these are in fact the same molecule. Weird, isn't it? But we see that those two are identical molecules to each other. If we just rotate it, if we flip it over, we'll end up with the same thing through this plane of symmetry. So because it's symmetric, we can flip it over, we get the same thing. In this case, let's see, we get one, two, three. So this is our, uh, let's see, one, two, three, that's RS. This one is gonna be SR. These two happen to be enantiomers of each other, but they're the same molecule. And we have a special term for that. So when enantiomers are identical due to symmetry, They are called meso compounds. So in reality, we only see three compounds here. If we were to just have a mixture of all these things, we have the first compound, the second compound, and these two are the third compound because they're the same. They are identical to each other. So we've just rotated this and we saw that they're the same thing. They represent the same compound. So, you know, we're, we're looking, I'm going to actually draw this as a plane. So if we're looking at this plane of symmetry through this molecule, whenever you have a plane of symmetry through it, you have the potential for meso compounds. So with the, the left pair, we don't have symmetry along that plane because otherwise we would have, they would both need to be wedges or dashes. And as a result, we would expect because we have two uh, chiral centers in this compound, in these compounds, that we would have four enantiomers or four stereoisomers, we should say, but really we only have three because two of them are the same as each other due to that symmetry. And so this is a meso compound. So it's, um, it's uh, the same thing. So they are, um, they're just called meso. So this happens when we have planes of symmetry. Typically this happens with rings. So for example, we can have, mm -mm. so that was a six membered, why don't we do a five membered one? or a four-membered ring. We're going to see here, 
I don't know. These would both be meso compounds as drawn because they have planes of symmetry. In fact, let me let me draw this one a little bit differently just so we don't have the same thing. These are both meso compounds. Because we have those planes of symmetry through them. They're symmetrical. And as a result, we can flip them over and the enantiomer that would just be the uh the wedge version here is identical. So even though this will be, let's see, one, two, three, that's S, one, two, three, wait, one, that's R, sorry. This one's S. Um, we'll see, it'll be the opposite. If we were to do this, the, uh, absolute configuration for those, we would see it's the opposite. But even so, those are the same compound. So when your enantiomers are identical because of symmetry, you'll still end up with different letters for them, but they're really the same compound. So RS, 1R2S, dimethylmercaptocyclohexane, uh, is the same as the SR one. They are identical to each other. These are equal. Same thing here. Honestly, I could draw it this way. These two are identical to each other. I could draw it this way. Because of that symmetry. They're all identical. I could draw them on wedges or dashes, doesn't matter. All of these are the same molecule. I'm not drawing anything new. But we might think, okay, some of these are enantiomers. But they're all the same molecule. All right, so just be aware that sometimes enantiomers will be identical to each other due to symmetry. And you'll end up with meso compounds. All right, so, cool. Let's talk about other projections and how to do S and R with those. So let's talk about, let's do a, let's do Newman projections first. Remember for a Newman projection, let's go ahead and look at this bond. Newman projections, wedges go on the right, dashes go on the left. Uh, we then have we have got uh, our Newman projection here. Yes, if we want to do the RNS on this, if we want to do absolute configuration. Thankfully, our back carbon is not chiral, so we don't have to worry about it. But our front, chiro, our front carbon is chiral. And so we have to think, okay, this should be priority one, our bromine. Priority two would be going to the back, but we don't really have that. The other three we do have though. And so just like before, we're going to pretend to switch two of them. So while we can't really draw that, if I switch our hydrogen with our back carbon, I can make, if I just switch those two, pretend that I have the ethyl group then on the left and hydrogen in the back, we can now do this and say, okay, well, this as drawn, or now with the switch, is S, but we switched it. And so we, uh, no, we end up having R on this particular one. 
So just like before, you'll swap out your lowest one so it's going backwards on the dash. So we don't have dashes and wedges in Newman projections, right? We just have kind of we're looking at it directly. So, I mean, if we were to do it normally, we'd say, okay, one, two, three, yeah, it's R, done. But um, if you're given a Newman projection instead and asked to do it on a Newman projection, we can do it the same way we did before, is if we had our hydrogen not on the dash, not behind, we would just swap it, do our R and S, and then swap the letter. So we got S by switching out our priority two and four. And so we need to switch it, switch our letter to go to R. Do we see how we did that? We just pretended that our ethyl group was the one on the left there instead of the one in the back. Switched R, H, and ethyl. And we end up calculating as S but we need to remember that because we switched, we have to flip it. So now it's R. Let's do another one. Let's just do another Newman projection. This time, we do have two chiral centers. This is a little tougher. Doing the front one maybe is not so bad. Maybe. We can look at this. Let's look at the front carbon first. So front carbon has three things. Plus one is four things. <laughs> Should always have four things, right? We have a chlorine. We have an ethyl group. We have an isopropyl group. And then we have the back carbon, which has uh, an oxygen and some carbons and other things. So priority wise, priority one is the chlorine. Priority two should be the one in the back, right? Because it has an oxygen on it. The isopropyl and ethyl groups only have carbons. So it's always by atomic number. So the carbon in the back is number two. Do we all see that because it has an oxygen? We'll redraw this as a uh, wedge dash and we'll see that we're not crazy. If we're looking on the front carbon again, priority three then is isopropyl because it's got two carbons connected to the carbon, whereas the ethyl group has only uh, one other carbon. So if we want to switch our low priority group out, if we switch it out, we calculate this as R, but because we switched, our answer will be S for this front carbon. Because our, our second priority was in the back, it's the back carbon. Our other priority is, uh, our last priority is the ethyl group. So we have to pretend those are switched and then we'll get S. I'm sorry, then we'll calculate R and then we'll switch it to get S. We'll draw this in wedge dash and it'll be perhaps a little bit easier as well. That carbon is even tougher to do because we're looking at it from the other side. So we have options. We could redraw it as now the front carbon. We could redraw it. We could say, okay, well, we had OH up. That's fine. We have methyl and then hydrogen. Don't forget, if we're, sw if we're rotating around, the methyl that was on the left is now on the right. 
And then on the back, we have all our same stuff as before. Those will be uh, also uh, inverted because we're just rotating this molecule around. So if we look at this front carbon, we're looking at number one. Back carbon will be priority two. Methyl group three, hydrogen four. And so again, here we're going to need to switch. So one, two, three, that's S, which turns into R for our back carbon. So a lot of this is about visualization. Visualization. If we try and kind of work it this way, If we end up swapping our hydrogen on that side, we do get R, but we technically have to switch it twice. Because <laughs> first off, we're looking the wrong direction. And second, we did a switch of the hydrogen. So that's a little bit more tricky. I would not recommend doing that. So um, I, I would not recommend doing it that way. I would recommend either rotating the molecule or redrawing it in a different projection. If we want to redraw it, we can double check that we have S and R here. If we redraw it as sawhorse, sawhorse uh, keeps the bonds. It shows us that bond. Remember, sawhorse shows us the bond between the two. We have the ethyl group here, hydrogen there, OH methyl group Cl. Uh, which one? The, the sawhorse or the uh, Newman? I get it. There's a lot of different projections and they all are terrible. Newman, yeah. I get it. So if you think that you're looking at the molecule, if you want to rotate that 180 degrees around, so here we go. Here's my, my Newman projection. Here's my, um, I've got a thing pointing in the back. I'm going to rotate my molecule 180 degrees around. Now that thing is pointing that way, right? It was pointing right. Now it's pointing left. I don't know. Can we even see that terrible kind of, let's see. <laughs> I don't have any models with me, but I actually have nothing because I'm, I'm in... The LA house that has that's completely empty. Okay. Here we go. Here is our Newman projection. So I need to rotate this 180 degrees so that we are going to have this part now be in the back. So I'm gonna do that. Note what happens. My substituent is now pointing left. Previously it was pointing right. Now it's pointing left. Again, I don't have my models, but suffice it to say, when you rotate a Newman projection, your right and left things switch. Up and down stay the same. I think it's, of course, easiest to just do things as wedge dash, but because Unfortunately, this course has so much to do with visualizing molecules, we do ask that you do these in different projections. So sawhorse may be a little bit easier for us to, to grasp with. Maybe a little bit. Maybe. So if we do the sawhorse, one, two, three, Four, we see that we have currently the uh, carbon in the back, number two. If we want to switch that, we could do it. Or we could kind of try and rotate it in our minds. Tough, tough thing. Models really help here for learning how to visualize these. But you do the same thing. It should still be S, right? It's the same molecule. But if we see that um, the sawhorse, once we have it, 
makes it a little bit easier for us to go to wedge dash. Notice these things if we now rotate this molecule. So Newman is like straight on. Sawhorse is a little bit on the side. Wedge dash, we usually look at it uh, horizontally on. And so if we do that, if we want to redraw this, normally we don't use IPR in a wedge dash, but we're going to see that everything that's on the right becomes a wedge. So notice again here, uh, the ethyl group is pointing up slightly up, hydrogen pointing slightly down. So we still draw them up and down. But the stuff on the right of our Newman projection or of our sawhorse is a wedge. Those are the things coming out at us. And the stuff behind is the dash. So chlorine pointing up is the dash. Hydro, or what's the other one? Um, Methyl pointing down on the dash. So stuff on the right becomes a wedge. Stuff on the left becomes the dash. Everything still points up and down as it did before. And so now it becomes maybe a little bit easier to <laughs> work with this, maybe. But you'll want to be comfortable switching between these projections. And I get that it's a total pain. The worst is Fisher. We haven't even gotten to Fisher yet. Actually, Fisher's easier for doing RNS with, but um, harder to convert between. Like Sawhorse, Wedge Dash, and Newman are fairly easy to interconvert. Like we know how to go from a Wedge Dash to a Newman. Notice, by the way, the bromine was on a wedge, ended up on the right side. Uh, if we had something on a dash, it would be on the left side. Um, these just take practice. Thankfully, on this exam, we don't have to necessarily worry about anything besides Newman, the exam that you're having on Monday, right? So we just have Newman and wedge dash. And then, of course, the chairs and all that fun stuff. But uh, with these projections, we can still go between them. They're still valid. They're still useful. Your homework will have these projections. And you'll want to familiarize yourself determining R and S with each one. Because I'm going to be asking you to compare something in Newman and something in Wedge Dash. Or something in Newman and something in Sawhorse. Or Sawhorse and Fisher. And there's a lot of different ways of representing the molecule that are all valid. And so it's important that we understand how to recognize them in all of these different projections. And I hated this when I was taking Ochem. I thought it was the worst part. But it is very helpful. It is very helpful in the long run. So it is going to take a lot of work. Again, this is not on this upcoming exam. So we have time to practice this. Um, and so going between these... Uh, is super important. So, um, we'll talk about those. If we want to convert this to Fisher projection, by the way, easiest way to do that is from Sawhorse or Newman. Those are easier to go to Fisher than a wedge dash is, in my opinion. If we want to do a Fisher projection, we want uh, we want an eclipsed. Get an eclipsed one. You want an eclipsed confirmation uh, of of a Newman or Sawhorse projection uh, with uh, groups. Um, Okay, I'll show you what I mean. We want for a Fisher projection, if I keep the front carbon the same, it was isopropyl, uh, was it ethyl, and then chlorine. We want to draw this as eclipsed with something pointing down, like vertically down. So if we do this eclipsed, 
I'm going to rotate our back carbon so that our methyl lines up with the isopropyl. It doesn't really matter which one I line up where. We're not doing conformational analysis here. I'm just rotating this molecule. So I'm going to rotate the back carbon clockwise 60 degrees. By clockwise, I mean counterclockwise because I don't know what I'm saying. Counterclockwise to the left. OH and then H. So to go to Fisher, Fisher has everything pointing down that's vertical. Remember, vertical things is down, aka dash, and horizontal things are wedges. So now we're really looking at this molecule from the top. Now that we've pointed our groups down, if we look at this molecule from the top, we're going to see, okay, well, we've got isopropyl down, so we're going to put that on a vertical line. We've got methyl down. We're going to put that as a vertical line. And we have two carbons in between them. And so if we're looking at this molecule, everything that's on the right is on the right. Everything that's on the left is on the left. And that's your Fisher projection. Easiest to get from an eclipsed Newman. It's hard to go from wedge dash to uh, new uh, to Fisher, but it's possible. All we have to do is rotate it so that oxygen is pointing down. But that again requires us to rotate in our mind. If we do that, if we rotate this oxygen so that it's pointing down. That means we've rotated it this way towards, towards ourselves. So that means that our hydrogen is now going to be uh, in the front, kind of pointing up in the front. And our methyl group is now pointing back in the back, as hard as it is to say that. And then now we can look at it from above and see what's what. But I think it's hard to do that. Yuck. It's hard to go from Wedge Dash to Fisher, but relatively easy to go from Newman to Fisher, as long as it's eclipsed. So we're just redrawing everything as if we were looking at it from above. Fun, 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 fun. All right, let's let's hold off on this right now. I want us to give us a break to not worry about these. I'm going to show you how to uh, do RNS with Fisher, and then once we have relaxed a little bit of the all the confusion, we can do some interconverting between molecules or projections. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and do one. So here's a carbon in a Fisher projection. Remember that Fisher projections really mean that anything vertically drawn is a dash and anything horizontally drawn is a wedge. But we typically don't look at things with two wedges and two dashes because we typically look at them in some plane or the other. So what we can do is choose any one dash and one wedge to be straight lines. And so I can choose to say, okay, chlorine and bromine, that's you two. And now I've got something in kind of wedge dash that we can use. So Fisher projections really mean everything vertical is a dash, everything horizontal is a wedge. We can choose any one of each of those 
to make into uh, some straight lines. One wedge, one dash. So one vertical, one horizontal we keep as a straight line. Everything else we have to put as wedge and dash. And now we can see, ah, this molecule I have an easier time to, uh, to work with. Right, so again, unfortunately this time we have our hydrogen on a wedge, which means that we're gonna need to have that as a, a switch, a switcheroo. First priority, bromine. Second priority, chlorine. Third priority, oxygen. Fourth priority, hydrogen. Hopefully the priorities are okay here. We can treat this just as a regular wedge dash molecule. And so we just need to switch the two, the three and the four. We need to switch the three and the four so that our hydrogen is in the back. And if we do a switch, we'll say, aha, we're going to the left, counterclockwise, driving to the left. That's an S configuration, but we switched so it becomes R at the end. So this particular molecule has an R configuration. And if it helps you to rotate it, totally doable. If I chose my oxygen and bromine, that's a little bit closer to the way we normally see things, right? We normally see things, ah, oxygen, bromine. We like them to be on their little angles. So just rotate slightly. Remember with this, you can choose any of them to be your straight lines, one wedge and one dash. And so we would again need to switch. We'd say one, two, three, four. We'd still need to switch. We would get S that we would need to convert to R. So uh, I know it's a little bit easier to look at the bottom left one there, but top right one should not be that much, or the kind of middle, this one should not be that difficult to uh, figure out the R and S with. So as long as you switch your dash and wedge, that's what, that's what counts. Okay, so uh, I don't know what I was doing before, I guess. Okay, um, so any of those uh, can be done that way. You would do the same process for every carbon in your chiral molecule. We can do it with this thing. If you're looking at a Fisher projection, here's the one we had before. If we were to choose this, we would say, okay, we have doo -doo 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 -doo. I'm gonna keep the ethyl and isopropyl. Our chlorine stays on a wedge. And I'm gonna just leave it as an R group. R meaning there's, I've just substituted. I'm saying R is this uh, this bit here, or whatever it is. I'm just saying all this stuff is R. So I'm just gonna substitute a new letter just to make things a little bit easier on myself. I mean, if you try and draw all that stuff back there, have fun. Imagine when you have three chiral centers in a Fisher projection, or six, like, if you don't use the substitution, it's going to be very tough. But it's important that we still assign our priorities the same way. So chlorine is still priority one. We have to remember what the R group is because the R group had an oxygen on it, which is going to put R as priority two. Isopropyl is priority three and ethyl is priority four. We want to switch out our dash with priority four. I'll draw that out. I feel like I've not actually drawn that yet. 
So if I switch them, now we see, okay, now we have our lowest priority group in the back. And so we can just go ahead and do this. We get R. But since we switched, since we switched, this enantiomer is R. So our original molecule is S. Our original molecule is S. And that's something we, we figured out before, right? We saw that uh, this front carbon was S. We saw it in the other projections. So we can do it in any of these other things. And if we were to look at the top carbon instead, we would say, okay, we've got methyl, we've got H, we've got OH, and we've got R. If we're looking at the carbon back there. And so again, we're going to switch some of them to be wedges and dashes. So whatever, I'm going to have that there. And why not? Here, I'll be, I'll be good this time. I'll switch things. Doesn't matter what you choose. One still is a wedge, one is still a dash. Dashes are only vertical ones. Wedges are only horizontal ones. We assign our priorities. It's a little bit easier to do the configuration for Newman or for Fisher projection than for the back carbon of the Newman, in my opinion. We had priority one the oxygen. Priority two was our R group because it had chlorine on it. Priority three the methyl, and then priority four hydrogen. So we need to switch our our uh, groups. And so keeping our priorities one, two, three, we see that this, this one is written as R, which means that our original molecule was, I'm sorry, this is S. We went left there, I'm sorry. That one is S, and so we end up with R as our original molecule, which as we did see way back when, we did get R for that molecule. So it's a lot. There's a lot of mental energy required to do something that is theoretically not so hard. But in reality, yes, it is tough. This is a very tough section of OCHEM. Um, this is the most sort of visualization and kind of spatial reasoning that you'll need in OCHEM is right now. You'll need more deductive reasoning later on when we talk about spectroscopy. And after that, when we start talking about synthesis, that's when you have to be thinking of all these different things at once. And so there's a lot of skills that OCHEM teaches you that, or that it needs you to kind of build up to succeed. So this one, the spatial reasoning, being able to rotate things, understand how they're constructed in three dimensions, super useful super useful and it's something that you are going to build uh, by doing this so it may be worth practicing just taking some fisher projections doing them as newman projections doing them as sawhorses doing them as wedge dashes it's very uh important that we're, they have these skills to interconvert them you're going to see in your homework you're going to be doing that a lot but let's look at a couple more examples. Let's take our simple molecule. We had this bromine. This was uh, our R2-bromobutane, right? We can put this in a Fisher projection. Let's do it in all projections. If you're starting with wedge dash, easiest one probably to do is sawhorse. So sawhorse, you look at the same side of the molecule, but it just kind of makes the 3D a little bit more obvious. 
So if we draw a sawhorse, remember a sawhorse uh, is always going to look like like this. It's essentially like a, a cyclohexane where we've got like axial and equatorial things. I should draw that one down. Okay, I should really try to draw that one down. There we go. A sawhorse looks like this. This is the, the basic structure of a sawhorse. <clears throat> We're going to see this bit that's pointing down here is the same thing as that one. That's the one that's pointing down. So we're kind of looking at this from slightly above and to the side for a sawhorse. And the one that's the opposite, the one that's trans to that original pointing down one, would be your other carbon. So these are both methyl groups. Those methyl groups are our up and down parts on our sawhorse. And so we're going to see that stuff on the right, oops, will be anything that was a wedge. Dashes will go on the left. So in this case, we only have one wedge, and it's on the carbon that has that pointing down methyl. We have one wedge and it's on this purple carbon. That's our purple carbon. And so our bromine will go there on that wedge, on the right. The rest is all hydrogen, so who cares? We have, essentially, remember we do have a hydrogen on a wedge here and on a dash. And we have a hydrogen on a dash back there. So two dashed hydrogens go on the back, two and one dashed hydrogen goes on the, on the right. So do we, do we see how to get sawhorse from wedge dash? It is the closest one for all our projections to wedge dash. It's, it's not too bad. So again, we're just kind of peeking up at the side of the molecule. Newman, we're going straight on. Fisher, we're rotating and then going straight on. We can go to Fisher from this as well. We can rotate this so it becomes eclipsed. We can go to Fisher. We'll do Newman over here. And we can do Fisher over here. Uh, nope. Fisker. There we go. We first want to rotate this thing. If we're going to go to Fisher, we need to rotate it so that it's eclipsed. If we do that, I'm going to just, by the way, indicate that one as a special hydrogen. It's, it's not special for, for this at all, but I want to just show you that even though those two hydrogens, we still have to distinguish what goes where. So if we're to rotate that back carbon around so that the methyl group is now pointing down or the H is pointing down, it really doesn't matter. We can put the H down. Why not? If we're going to have a sawhorse that's rotated, if I just rotate all this stuff, uh, let me use the light blue for that. If I rotate this 60 degrees, that'll eclipse it, right? It's currently drawn as staggered. So if we want to eclipse it, we can draw it that way. This is our, our special hydrogen now. I'm just rotating that down. We have our methyl group still. And uh, that's the other purple H, and that's the H on the top. So I just wanted to, to show you that we're keeping track of that hydrogen. I just want to show that there's, uh, even though they're the same hydrogen, I want to show you which one goes where. So if it was not a hydrogen, if it was some other substituent, uh, you'd be good on that. So now we are able to draw it as Fisher. Remember that everything on um, that's pointing down is a vertical line. So we have two carbons in the middle. We have a methyl group here 
And we have the other one that's pointing down is our hydrogen, H1. Our special hydrogen is pointing down. I lost something, didn't I? I lost a bromine. There it is. Everything that's on the right of your sawhorse, just like with Newman, stays on the right. So our bromine stays on the right. Our other methyl group is on the right. Do we see how both of those are on the right side of the sawhorse? So we have our things pointing down. Those become our vertical lines. Everything that's on the right of our kind of chain is on the right of our Fischer projection. And we're going to have the hydrogens that were on the left uh, still being on the left there. So we can go from Fisher, uh, we can go to Fisher from Newman or from Sawhorse just by redrawing the molecules. And in order to get to Fisher, you want it in the eclipsed conformation so that it's very easy for us to see what's pointing down, what's pointing to the right, what's pointing to the left. With Newman, uh, hopefully Newman is, is, right now you guys are so experienced with it. Our, our original sawhorse as Newman, we have methyl down. We have the bromine up to the left, to the right, sorry, and then hydrogen to the left. We have our special hydrogen to the bottom right, and then our methyl group points up. Sawhorse to Newman is not bad. We're just turning our eyes slightly. Everything that's uh, on the right, still on the right, pointing up, it's pointing up, all the same thing. And then we would need to rotate this molecule in Newman to be able to put it into Fisher as well. So from wedge dash, here, let me, let me do the whole thing. As wedge dash, easiest one to go first is sawhorse, because that's the closest. Once you have your sawhorse, it's very easy to go from sawhorse to Newman. By now, though, you're, you're pretty much, you've had a lot of experience going from wedge dash to Newman, so you can go there directly. Uh, from Fisher, though, is the most different from wedge dash. And so you'll probably want to go to Fisher. Sorry, this is totally just rotated. And then we went to Fisher. Um, you'll want to either go to a staggered, or I'm sorry, eclipsed sawhorse or eclipsed Newman. Once you have it in eclipsed conformation, you can then move it uh, where you need it to go. Once it's eclipsed, everything that's pointing down is your vertical lines on your Fisher projection. Everything that's pointing to the right stays on the right. Everything that's pointing to the left stays on the left. Notice I could have staggered, sorry, eclipsed my methyl groups. I could have rotated that 180 degrees instead of 60 degrees. It doesn't matter which eclipsed conformation you use to get to Fisher. We're going to see that I could have done it where I take my sawhorse and instead have rotated a, some more than, than we did in this one. If I took that and instead rotated it another 120 degrees, so that now I have H, CH3, and our special H, our purple one. I could redraw this as Fisher too. And we're going to see that, that oof, these are the same. Uh, we have H and bromine. 
these two are equal to each other. We can rotate things on our Fisher projection if we really wanted. Note, it, note that that's just rotating. I've just rotated that top part there. Left the bottom part alone, but I can rotate the top part, switch the three things around, and I still have the same molecule. And that just comes from a different rotation, a different eclipsed conformation. So let me switch back to horizontal here. So these two are the same structure. I could also draw it as H here, H1 here, CH3 there. I could rotate it again. Same thing on bottom stays the same because I'm not rotating that right now. But this can help you determine your RNS, understanding that you can rotate these molecules like this. If I rotate the bottom carbon on my Fisher projection, if I rotate everything on the bottom, I can do that. We just switch the same positions with these. And this is actually going to make it easier for us to do RNS. So if I rotate this, now I have my hydrogen on a dash. And I can do whatever here. Wedge there, wedge on the other side. And now it's super easy. Because now I can say, aha, one, two, three, boom, we are right. Don't even have to think about it anymore. So if you rotate your Fisher projection, it'll save you the time of having to uh, do a switcheroo and then having to think about going backwards. So the, the beauty of all of these projections is they allow you to do certain things more easily. Maybe. Some people might find it easier to do other things, but um, all of these do, do have their strengths and weaknesses. So uh, Fisher being the most different from Wedge Dash is probably the hardest to get to, but it's very easy to see things in Fisher, especially if you have multiple chiral centers in a line. Uh, it, it can be a little bit easier to deal with because you can rotate it pretty easily so you can always have your hydrogen on a dash. So it's easier to rotate things in Fisher than it is in the other projections. Okay, and by Newman's pretty okay to rotate. Wedge dash is a little bit harder to rotate in your mind. But Fisher is super easy to rotate things at the end because you can just swap them. So, yeah. Woof. Look at how much we've done. I just want to do one last bit. We have five minutes left. I'm going to introduce the last thing here. So we also used, we used cis trans for alkenes, right? We could say that this was cis dichloroethylene. We want to avoid using cis trans now because what happens if I have Something like this. Can I say cis trans? Not really, because it's not sure what I'm talking about. But we're going to have another way to do it. We're going to assign two letters. We have two different letters to assign for alkenes uh, when we have multiple substituents. Cis trans you can use if there's only two things, and it's obvious what they are. But when we have more than two things, or maybe it's not so obvious, we can't use cis and trans anymore. So we're going to do something similar to what we've done with R and S. We're going to assign priority uh, to the vinyl groups. Remember, vinyl means attached to the double bonded carbon.
and then uh, we'll go from there. So if we're assigning priority on the right side of the molecule, bromine has priority over chlorine. With this, we only have two things to give priority to. So one and two. That's it. On the left side of our double bond, chlorine is priority one, oxygen is priority two. And then we look at the uh, uh, look at the relationship. of higher priority and so if they're on the same side what we used to call cis those would be called uh, z for i don't speak german zusammen i don't know cis ones we would call z so instead of R and S, we have Z and what we'll see is E. If they are on the opposite sides, what we used to call trans, that's E for Entgegen. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce German, I'm sorry. I can do uh, French, you know, Spanish, Italian, no problem, but German is a little tougher. But anyways, yes, yeah, so we're looking now. Our priority ones are on opposite sides, so this is an E alkene. Ta-da! Little bit easier than R and S. We don't have to rotate anything. We just have to look at their relationships. So uh, that's uh, the last thing I wanted to introduce. Let's do another one. The priority rules are, are the same as they are for for uh, R and S. So like triple bond still count as three carbons and, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, bu, 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 bu. And let's do, not that iodine, let's do uh, fluorine, yeah. So we want to assign priority to both sides. This side, we both have carbons, so we need to look at our first point of difference. This carbon has three carbon bonds three carbon, carbon, carbon. This one is bound to two carbons. So we're gonna win out with our triple bond here. And so that will be priority one on that side of the molecule. So it's bound to three carbons, where a triple one counts as bound, bound to three carbons. On the left side of the molecule, chlorine has the higher atomic number than fluorine does. So this is a, a Z alkene. Not too bad. End with something easy. So uh, it's all about choosing what has priority on which side and comparing them. They're both on the same side of the alkene. So uh, therefore, it's going to be a Z alkene. All right. So that's, that's all it is. It's not too bad. So technically, we are done with chapter five. So I'll post your homework. You can start working on it. It's a longer one. I'm going to give you a bit more time than a week. I'll give you maybe a week and a half to work on it because I know you've got your exam coming up, so it'll be due a little bit later. Um, but very, uh, it's a, a lot of work, this chapter. So, Okay, so uh, we have our exam on Monday. I've put up some practice exams. I'm probably only going to have time to make one exam key. So since um, I'll choose which one and I'll, I'll let you guys know. Um, though actually I think Kevin had posted his to one of them. So honestly he's usually pretty good. So uh, I'll double check Kevin's. I'll say if we can use that as one of our keys and I'll write a key for a different one. So we have some, some practice. Okay, so those are on Canvas, the practice exams. Um, so everything from chapter one to four will be on it. So uh, all of our, our Newman projections and, and cyclohexanes and naming things, all that's gonna be there. So stuff that was on your homework, um, you know, just 
maybe kicked up a notch and that's it. It'll be the same format as we did for, um, I guess I should write this. It's the same format we did for 113 last semester. There are fill, or like kind of free response exams. So it'll open at midnight. So it opens at midnight on Monday. It closes at 11.59 p.m. So you have 23 hours and 59 minutes to take the exam. So I would recommend saving at least 75, 90 minutes. That's what I'm shooting for. But since you have more time, you can spend more time if you want. Um, how it's going to work is it's all free response or there might be some easy multiple choice where you just circle your answer like on the practice exams uh, you're going to either print it out you're going to write on a tablet or you're going to write on blank paper these are kind of the three options we have here so if you can print it out and write on the exam that way, that's great. If you want to do it like, like I do with a tablet where you have the exam on your thing and then you just write on it, save it, submit it, that's fine with me too. I am fine with that. Uh, or if you don't have a printer, uh, you can just take a bank piece of paper and just write on that. Try not to put more than one question on one page just so uh, it's easier for me to follow. So if you're gonna do it on blank paper, Try and keep it to one question per page, please. Uh, one like kind of question, you're gonna see that some questions will have multiple parts. That's fine to keep on the same page. But like if we're doing chair cyclohexanes and all of a sudden I see Newman projections, like it's gonna be harder for me to grade. So try and um, keep it to one question per page. Okay. Um, so those are the three options. You're going to submit a PDF on Canvas. You can either scan it, submit it from a tablet. If you've written on it, you should be able to save it as a PDF. And then the other option would be to uh, use a phone app to make a PDF, uh, like Cam Scanner. That's an app that will let you take a picture using your phone as a PDF. And um, doing that, you'll submit it on Canvas as a PDF. Uh, and you'll also then also just double check it's submitted properly. Okay, so that's kind of how it's going to work. So you'll have all day, use whatever resources you want. It's free response. Normally you'd show your work, but there's not really work to show because we don't have math here. Um, but like, you know, for resonance and stuff, you definitely show your arrows. It's helpful if you do those in a different color for me so I can see if that's an option. If you don't have other colors, that's cool. That's fine. I will, I will, um, I'll be happy to work on it anyway. These are just things that'll make it easier for me. So if those are options that you have available to you to do different colors or whatever, please do. I would appreciate it, but I'm not going to force you. I'm not going to ding you. I'm not going to take points off if there are not like different colors for arrows so I can see things clearly. So, all right. So it, I, I want to make sure that there's no kind of confusion there. Um, so 24 hours to take it. I'm not going to have a lecture on Monday, so no stream, no stream on Monday, uh, so that you have the entire time to focus on, on your exam, okay? I know we, we ended a little bit later today because I forgot to go over the exam, but uh, that's that. So remember, this stuff from this week is not on it, so you can uh, cry about this stuff on Tuesday when you have to start learning it, so, okay? I, I am actually going to go ahead and post this one because I realized this will have the exam stuff. So I'm going to delete the other notes.
All right, so that's it for us. Best of luck studying. Um, I think, did you guys want to do a review on Friday? I can do one, I think. Um, just let me know. I put, put questions up if you want, if you want to do that. Uh, if you do post them review questions, then we can do it. Um, what did we do last time? 10 o'clock? Then uh, presumably the same time if we want. So if anyone puts any review questions out there, we will do a review question. So, and it'll be, we'll do the same thing we did last time on Discord, so you guys can ask, uh, and we'll we'll go from there. Okay. Alrighty, then I guess I'll see you Friday at ten o'clock for a review. Sounds good. Alrighty, take care, everybody. Enjoy your weekend, or not, not yet, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> All right, take care.